us, our world, and to change us. Uh, that's not at all what I wanted to say. <laughs> Starting over. That was early. <laughs>Do you want me to say anything about the, fel- the title of the Fellowship of Believers or just go into the reading? I don't think you have to. Okay. okay. Hey, remember, nobody's safe this week, so if you mess up. That's Good morning. Welcome to Worship with St. Paul Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Mark Don, and I'm glad you're here. As we're walking through this Easter season, we still enjoy that celebration, the identity we have in him. And so I greet you with this Easter greeting. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Will you join with me as we open in prayer in the name of our triune God? Holy Lord, we thank you for the way that you have claimed us, that you have cleansed us in the waters of holy baptism, for the way that you keep and preserve your church by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that this day we might remember the way in which your word has become flesh in Christ, in which your word continues to sustain us and guide and direct your church now and always. Bless our worship today that our singing, our speaking, our praying, our hearing, our reflecting all might be pleasing to you. For we pray this in the name by which you have made us your own. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in for his love. Jesus died for me, yes he died for me, oh the sun sets free, oh is free in thee, I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my 
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All right, if there are kids in your house, come on down to the front, gather around the TV, and get ready for the children's message. In just a moment, I'm going to say a word. And when I say this word, I want to know what comes to mind for you. So I'm going to say this word. I want you to picture just whatever happens in your mind. Whatever the word makes you think of, picture it, and then I want you to tell me what it was that you saw, okay? So here's the word. Powerful. Powerful. What comes to mind when you hear the word powerful? Go ahead. Say it out loud. Come on. Tell me. What comes to mind when you hear the word powerful? Now, I'm going to be honest. I have no idea what you just said out loud. I have no way of knowing what came to mind because I'm not in person with you. But I have a few guesses of what might have come to your mind. Uh, for some of you, when you hear the word powerful, you might think of God. That's, that makes sense. God is the most powerful thing in the whole universe. Okay. Um, for others, when you hear the word powerful, maybe you think of the ocean. Because the ocean, like the waves can be really, really strong. And if a boat isn't careful, it could get like knocked over because the ocean's pretty powerful. Maybe for others, when you hear the word powerful, you think of a superhero like Superman. He's got a lot of strength. He's strong. He's powerful. A lot of things come to mind when we think of the word powerful. But I'm thinking of something that I bet didn't come to anyone's mind Anyone who's watching, I really don't think they thought of this thing because it doesn't really pop up at first when we think of the word powerful. But what I'm thinking of are words. Words are powerful. Words can be so powerful that they change your entire life. This past week, my wife and I, Miss Taylor, we were celebrating one year of being married. That's crazy. We've been married for a whole year. When we said, I do, a year ago, and we became married, that changed everything in my life. That word has so much power because before then, it was just me and Jesus. But now it's Jesus, Taylor, and Nathan. Married has transformed my whole life. In a few years, hopefully, we'll have a baby. And that word will change everything in our life. And I will become a father. And that word will change everything because of how powerful it is. What are some words that have been so powerful in your life that it's changed everything? Maybe for some of you, your parents came to you one day and they said, Hey, guess what? We're moving. Moving. That's a powerful word because it means that you left your home and went to a new home. Maybe you moved to a new city or even a new state. Moving. And it changed everything because now you have new friends. You go to a new school. That word moving has a lot of power. And maybe for others, a word that's really powerful for you right now is the word lonely. Feeling and being alone by yourself. Because of what's happening in the world right now, it's been a long time since you've played with your friends, I bet. It's probably been a long time since you've seen your teacher in person. So you might be feeling really lonely. That's a powerful word right now. In our Bible reading for today, 
there's a man named Peter, and Peter is one of Jesus' like closest friends. And Peter is speaking to a group of people, and the words that he is speaking are so powerful that they changed people's lives forever. And in the scripture reading just a moment ago, you saw what happened afterwards. This, th the things that Peter was saying were so powerful that all the people listening, they sold everything they had and they gave the money to the poor. They got together and they shared their food with one another. They were hanging out like they were a family. And it all happened because of the power of Peter's words. Now, what were those words that Peter was speaking? What were the words that were so powerful that they changed people's hearts? Well, Peter was telling them about Jesus. Peter stood up and he told these people, he was like, hey, y'all knew Jesus. You knew who he was. You, you high-fived Jesus. Like, you were there. You saw him. And Jesus, he died on the cross. But Jesus didn't stay dead. Oh, no. Easter happened. Jesus woke up. He rose and he walked out of the grave. Jesus is alive. And he defeated death. He defeated hell. He defeated Satan. He defeated our sin. And Jesus died because of his great love for all of you. And he wants you to follow him, to trust him, and to, to just be loved by him. And those words were so powerful that they changed everyone's lives for, forever. And I want you to know today that the most powerful words you could ever hear are that Jesus loves you, that he died for you, that he rose for you, that he wants to be with you forever and ever and ever. Those are the most powerful, special, sweet, and incredible words. So how about this? Let's pray. We're going to use our words to thank him for the words that he's already given to us. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the power of words. Thank you for speaking to us and telling us that you love us. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. I love you too. In your name I pray, amen. I love you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the service. We'd like to ask you to consider giving to the ministry of St. Paul today through either your normal tithe or a special gift. And thankfully, we don't have to be in person to do this. All you need to do is download the Church Center app and create your free account to give online. Through the app, you can set up a secure, one-time, or reoccurring donation using a debit card, credit card, or bank account. You can also give directly through our website. Simply click the link in the video description below and you'll be taken to our online giving portal. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our risen Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From our reading from Acts chapter 2, I share with you especially this verse. They, the early Christians, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That's our text. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would be present among us here and now, that you would guide and move your church as we're gathered, as we're scattered, as we work, as we play, that in fact we might be about your kingdom purposes. And so, Lord, I pray that now you would bless the hearing and preaching of your word, that we might rest in your gospel, and that we might be joined with your mission, moved by the power of your Holy Spirit. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Um, so I got a Bible here, and I, I could tell you a lot of interesting stories about the Bible. You can find news stories about amazing things that happen regarding the Bible, where a, where a house burns down, and the only thing that's left is the family Bible. We can talk about Bibles that survived a tornado. I can show you news stories about soldiers in World War I and World War II who had these little pocket-issued Bibles with bullets embedded in them, and you want to go, that story is amazing. But even if I open God's word, I, I can tell you even about this word itself, 
there's amazing things that have come together, how God knit together his word over centuries, over millennia, in terms of how he reveals his word to us. This Bible, God, the one author, used over 40 people to write it. It was written in three different continents. Some of it was written in Europe, some in Asia, some in Africa. I could continue to tell you that those writers are over a period of several thousand years. And the diversity of voices that God uses to unveil, to, re- to open up his will among us, it's pretty amazing. The writers of God's word are those from fishermen to farmers, doctor, a, a musician, from kings in palaces to homeless prophets. And all of this is this amazing revelation of this one truth. All that I have here in God's word is that God is coming into a world that's broken and he is redeeming all things to himself. Now that's all pretty amazing and and we have that in mind when we come to our text here today. We've been walking through the book of Acts. It's the Gospel of Luke, part two, and it's saying here's what Jesus began to do in the Gospel and the book of Acts is what Jesus continues to do through his church, even through us. And it continues to unfold, this flowering, this blossoming of the gospel. It's this almost unstoppable movement around God's word. And so our reading talked about the early Christians who are gathered. It says they were all filled with awe. They were gathering together. They had everything in common. They gave to everyone as they had need. And then you even read this verse in how they do it so publicly. Every day they met together in the temple courts. It's a public gathering, and then you see that the Lord added to their number publicly those who were being saved every day. Now that might not seem radical to you and I because we wear crosses. We have them in our homes. We gather publicly as church, and we can't wait to do it again sometime soon, but understand the context. This is 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in our text. 50 days after their leader was killed and those that put him to death, we know that they are still plotting. They want to stamp out every ember of this flame that Jesus lit. And 50 days, well, you would understand if there was still a bit of insecurity, still a little bit of fear going on. Now, we know what that's like. You and I have tasted a world where there's insecurity and fear in any number of ways. And let me ask you, when you're feeling insecure, what happens in your life? Um, If you're insecure, do you become more generous or less? Less, right? Um, If you have fear, does your circle of connections, when you're fearful, does it become wider or does it become narrower? Narrower, of course. Because in a broken and fallen world, that's the way that things happen in the fallenness of sin. That's what sin does. It isolates, it cuts off. But here's the reality. It still does that, and and even in snowballing fashion. Let me ask you this, even as a for example. If, If someone's coming to you and they are over intense, if there's a sin issue, if there's a conflict going on, they come at you and they raise their voice, what do you do? I bet your volume goes up too. If, um, if something else is going on and, and a person is coming at you and they are condescending, they are dismissive, well, what are the fr- kind of phrases and things we say at that time? We tend to whisper and say, who does he, who does she think she is? And we return condescension in fashion. And so that goes, if, if someone's argumentative or prideful or selfish, we tend to return sin in kind. It's a really poisonous snowballing effect of sin. And it's a mess that you and I can observe certainly throughout our world, but it's a mess that you can often observe very much up close. That the sins that you find most detestable or the most frustrating in others are those which you're probably guilty of yourself. But our God comes and he continues to point us to his word that says, I will interrupt sin's brokenness. And Jesus comes on the scene and the stump speech of Jesus that he says everywhere he goes and that he lives are the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. 
let me tell you a little history lesson of good news. Specifically, let's talk about our own denomination. We're called the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. You know why? Because the first people that gathered, they happened to be in Missouri. When, when our first uh, forebearers of our church gathered, it started in 1847. At that time, there were 14 congregations and 12 pastors. Now this was a whole bunch of German immigrants. Life was hard for them. 40 years later, you wanna know what happened with the LCMS, the Lutheran Church? There was over 2,000 congregations. Do you know that in those four, first 40 years of our denomination in this country, they planted a church every single week? And you might go, those were times of massive immigration. Well, during those same years, the U.S. population grew by 17%. Lutherans grew by 27%. Germans witnessing, testifying to their faith. You want to tell me God's word changes people? I believe that. There was a brief period of time in the history of our denomination where in 1919 was the first time that there wasn't multiplying and growth of the Lutheran Church. Well, why? I think it had something to do with a whole bunch of people that were speaking German in the wake of World War I. But God's word and his good news continues to flow in and through us. There was a period of time from 1930 to 1950 where Lutherans were innovating, where they were doing all kinds of stuff. There were radio broadcasts. There were huge ministries, planting of Lutheran schools everywhere. There was an explosion. And these were not easy years. 1930 to 1950, these are the Dust Bowl years. This is the Great Depression. This is World War II and during that stretch of time, you want to know what Lutherans in this country did? They planted a new church every 3.5 days, reaching to those who were unlike them. You want to tell me what God's word, good news does? It moves us beyond ourselves, no matter what your cultural, no matter what, what your ethnic background is. God's word transforms people, and so it does, even in our text and even with us today. We're simply told that when Peter comes to the Christians in those days, he says, what should you do? Let me answer this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And he tells the story of the gospel. Christ came. He identified sin and its brokenness. And you and I go, oh, I get it. I, I see it in me too. But then he identifies himself with that sin, takes on sin's punishment. He dies and he rises again and all of a sudden they say, repent and believe the good news. They go, we do, and it changes how we live together. Now, I can't wait till we can be together in a beautiful sanctuary again. But until then, I, I occasionally imagine where everybody's watching and participating in this worship service. I picture couches, I picture family rooms, uh, kitchen tables. I picture people in their house, some people in their office, some people on a, on a computer, on a tablet, on a TV, in bed, on a couch, at a table, all these places. And it makes me smile because when I read this text here today, well, I, I read verses like this. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. God's word is not a location. It's God's word lets loose in people's lives and the church becomes deployed. I think about this a lot these days. I'm starting to imagine days when maybe you and I will get to gather again. But I understand this about the movement of the church. It's not about the big show. It's, and I, I, frankly, I don't see it happening in churches in the really near future. Not that it's gonna be huge mass gatherings, that there's gonna be spectacles, but the gospel was never really about what you spectate, but rather how God invites you to participate. And so in the meantime, how in fact will God continue to move us, his church? Well, I think it'll be exactly like he works in Acts chapter two, and that we would be about this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And my question would be this. 
Why shouldn't this be another season in which God's word moves in and through us, where we move beyond ourselves, beyond what we're comfortable with, beyond what we're familiar with, and that even when we're going, I wonder when life will get back to normal? Well, maybe our prayer gets to be this. God grant us a new normal where the way that you have moved in and through your people in ages past, Lord, grant that it might be so now. Let your Holy Spirit loose among us now and always. God's peace be with you. Amen. Join with me and our family of faith all over the world as we confess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Jesus encourages us to pray. Therefore, let us come before his throne, bringing prayers for all people according to their needs. Blessed shepherd, you established your church with your sacrificial death and mighty resurrection. Grant us devotion that we may abide in the teaching of the apostles and honor the fellowship of the church. Guard us against all enemies of your word and keep us within the care of your flock and staff forevermore. Mighty Shepherd, you hold in your hands all the might of man, and you hold accountable those who would govern your people. Grant to us good government and good leaders who will honor your purpose, protect your people, serve the cause of justice, and defend our liberty against all threats. Give them wisdom and moderation in their pandemic response. Loving shepherd, you love the world enough to shed your blood, and you desired that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Inspire and equip your church and her ministers to speak faithfully and boldly your word and bless all those who serve us on your behalf. 
Holy Shepherd, you have clothed us with Christ's righteousness and taught us to love all that is good, right, and true. Bless all artists and artisans, composers and musicians, craftsmen and writers, that they may employ all their skills for your glory and in service to the gospel, and that the arts may testify to your saving death and resurrection. Merciful Shepherd, your wounds are our healing, and your voice calls us to you in time of need. Hear us on behalf of all those who suffer in body or mind, who grieve those whom they love and to whom death draws near. Hear the names of those we speak out loud in our homes at this time. Grant them healing according to your will, grace to sustain them in the day of trouble, and hope of the new and everlasting life to come. Be with the unemployed and the distraught, and return them to health and livelihood. Gracious Shepherd, you seek out those who have fallen, and restore them, sinners, to repentance. Send forth your Spirit to rekindle faith in the hearts of those who have fallen away from the truth who have been overcome by temptation and sin. Bring good from ill and increase in all the hunger for your word and a recognition of our need that many may be gathered into your flock when the church doors are opened wide again. Giving shepherd, you have withheld anything from us but emptied yourself fully upon the cross that we might be saved. Move our hearts to such devotion and teach us such generosity that we may bring to you the tithes and offerings of a grateful heart and serve our neighbor in need with the resources you have supplied to us so abundantly. O oh, great good shepherd, we pray. We pray that you hear your sheep and answer our prayers with mercy, granting us those things that are profitable for us, for our salvation, and keeping from us all things harmful. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Join with me in the Easter refrain. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Do a dab, Dad. And I'm like, I do like a T-Rex dab. <laughs> Just a little bit. Are we going? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't put that in.